Welcome back to another segment here on GEMS Podcast. I'm the founder and host, Ms. Genesis Amaris Kemp, and with me today is Sandra Hunter. And here is a bit about Sandra. Sandra Hunter pivoted from being an English and creative writing professor to starting her business, Wild Women Leaders of Color, helping professional women release stress caused by workplace racism and center them in her story to recognize their powerful place in the world. She also created the Stealth Auntie Network, part of WWLOC, that pairs professional women with young women students who are entering or about to enter the workplace. So the next generation is prepared for professional development and promotion. Knowing firsthand the many faces of racism, both personally and professionally, Sandra has spent 25 years teaching women of color, working with undeserved communities, and spent two years in Kenya helping to develop a language interface interference program for students taking national exams in their third language and assisted with establishing women's co-ops, empowering local women to have economic autonomy. She has a long resume of speaking at conferences, moderating panels, and leading workshops. And today, we're going to learn more about Sandra's story, why is that her superpower, as well as weave in the effects of racism with the, with the BIPOC community as a whole. So without further ado, please welcome Sandra Hunter. Hi, so glad to be here, Genesis. It's, been, it's wonderful that you've invited me, and I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Sandra. And before we dive into this segment, because it's going to be a lot of heavy information, but necessary, I want the audience to get a chance to connect with you in a fun way, as well as, you know, personally. So I like to do that one or two ways, and I'm sure you're familiar. I either do an icebreaker or a rapid fire 10 question game. So what are you in the mood for? Wow, both of those sound really good. Let's um, let's do an icebreaker. Okie dokie, we're breaking the ice with Sandra Hunter. <laughs> Here's the question. I want you to share something crazy that you have done in your life or a fun and interesting fact about you. Okay. So I learned how to bribe a customs official while I was working in Kenya. And as somebody who's been very anxious to be on the right side of the law, you know, being a brown person, you're very much, you know, much more more, uh, visible, as it were. So this is the first time I'd ever done anything like that. And it was when I was sending some things home to England after my two year uh, stint in Kenya. And my taxi driver drove me to the airport and I had this big box and it was full of things like a a stool and some drums and, you know, all these large items I couldn't take on the plane. So I took it in and um, the customs official looked at it and said, we can't see inside it, so you can't send it. I thought, well, how are you supposed to see inside it? It's a box, right? So he said, what we'll have to do is break it open. I thought, if you break it open, you know, the thing will just fall apart. So I went back to my taxi driver. What am I supposed to do? And he said, he wants money. Give him some money. So I went into my purse and I walked back in and I started waving this big 50 shilling note in the air. And of course, that was the wrong thing to do because the guy just looked absolutely horrified and furious. And I thought, oh, I'm going to end up in a cell, you know, being electrocuted and shocked and have somebody's foot in my neck. So I had it behind my back and I folded it behind my back into a small like little square. And immediately his attitude changed. He said, well, what's in the box? I said, well, there's books and there's this and there's that. And so he finally said, well, now we've got the list. I think it'll be okay. So he finally extended his hand to shake my hand and I palmed the $50 note to him. So that was that was my I was so terrified. My whole body was shaking because I really thought I was going to be arrested for attempting to bribe a customs official. But clearly that was what they expected. So it was OK. So I got away. Oh, wow. That is interesting. And from my background in oil and gas and, you know, when you're working in that field, we travel a lot. Um 
worldwide. I never had a chance to travel worldwide. I only did domestic travel, but they always told us in our CBT computer-based training, never do grease payments, which are like you're greasing the hands of another official because not only will it make the company look bad, but you could also pay for the repercussions right. in that country. So that was like, I could only imagine how nerve wracking that would have I been. Was- sweating gobs because when my taxi driver said you have to bribe my look they'll take me into this dark cell and nobody will ever hear of me again that'll be it I'll be done but apparently that's what you were supposed to do amazing and thank you for sharing that and let's dive into your story Sandra because before you started doing the work that you are doing now there's definitely things that you have gone through in your life personally and professionally that have made you that has made you the woman you are today. So I want to hear a little bit about your background and then why you believe that storytelling is so important and you use it as your superpower, but plus your passion for the effects of racism Mm -hmm. and BIPOC, because we are both women of color. You are originally from somewhere else and I'm first generation with parents that are foreigners so we have a little bit of similarities in a sense we do so let me open since this is focused in story with a story Um, about 25 years ago I was in a swimming pool changing room putting my swimming hat on and this woman just came up to me and said you're Indian and I said no because at the time I had learned by that time I'd learned that I was many things and I'll go into that in a section in a second but she kept following me around and saying you're Indian I know you're Indian and I was getting more and more discomforted and saying actually I'm not and she said I've been to India this is a white woman I've been to India I've seen the woman I know what they look like and you're Indian and it really impacted me at that time I was just shaking because it was just why am I being attacked because this woman wants to claim that I'm Indian but it made me understand that I needed to claim my heritage and my heritage is Sri Lankan, Anglo-Indian which I'll talk about in a second, Portuguese, Dutch and Scots and it makes for a much longer introduction but we get to talk about British colonialism and you know the spice trade all that kind of stuff which is kind of cool. So Anglo-Indian Um, This is my father's side of the family. During the British occupation of India, um, the troops were brought over from England to keep peace, to oppress the Indians, basically, because that's what the British are so good at doing. And um, of course, they had to stay there. In the 19th century, there wasn't an easy way home, right? You couldn't fly home. You certainly couldn't get a fast boat home. It took six months. So um, they stayed and intermarried among the Indian population. And the British loved that because there was a buffer race created between the Indians and the English. And as that generation grew up and became adults, they were given key positions in communication, such as the police, the post office, railways, telegraph. So all of those positions in management were held by Anglo-Indians. So this was kind of a, a race that wasn't created by, but definitely encouraged by the British so that when the independence happened in 1949 in India, you were given the choice of either a British or an Indian passport. My grandmother, knowing that it would be impossible for my aunt to marry, because Anglo-Indians weren't trusted either by the British or by the Indians, she decided to bring the family to England. So that's that's how we ended up in England, because my grandmother brought us all across, where we faced patriarchalism and harassment and racism because the British were just coming out of World War II, hated foreigners, hated what they call foreigners or immigrants, right? So it was, it was an interesting uh, upbringing. So th- the idea of claiming my heritage is relatively new for me, but it's something that's felt so empowering, being uh, understanding that I'm mixed race and understanding that I belong to many cultures and loving those cultures and loving the fact that I get to introduce to talk to so many people who are also from mixed race and not, you know, sometimes we overlap. So that's kind of cool. Yes. And I love that you share that because my mother is West Indian. So she's from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So the West Indies and my father um, who passed in 2020 was from Curacao. So off the tip of Venezuela and 
um, he spoke four languages, wow. Dutch, Poppy Mento, English, and Spanish. And since we live in Texas, a lot of people are asking, is your dad a Black Mexican or is he what? Because when they hear him speak Spanish, they thought that he was something different or they couldn't figure him out or they're like, hmm, or all of these things. And I'm like, why do people pass their perceptions and unconscious biases on people who, you know, they may look a certain way, but when they open up their mouth, their dialect is different or etc. Yeah. That's and such a good point. So yeah. Good. And um, so it's, so it's interesting and kind of similar with myself when I was growing up, growing up, um, up until the point where I was in high school, you know, people just had that enviness because, you know, I took Spanish for three years and I was doing better than some of the Hispanic Latin origin kids. But they didn't know that my dad was working with me at home on Spanish oh. until my dad went to school one day. So it's just interesting to hear how some of the cultures blend. And then whenever you bring in-laws into the equation that are not in your racial group and you have to explain certain things to them, then you start to get more di diversity in there as well as sometimes a breakdown in culture and communication right. because you can either ruffle feathers. Yes, you can. That's so true. And I do think that there's such an interesting point you bring up about why do people have this reaction? And I think at root, we're very tribal. You know, it's the want to belong to a group that's our group, right? And this, this is very atavistic. But it also speaks to fear, doesn't it? Because we, we are unsure of this other person who looks different, you know, are they a threat? And, and we're seeing this, like we were just talking about, you know, the shooting yesterday, how the rush to tar, to, to, to tar this person or to, to uh, claim this person or, or um, just name him as, oh, he's an illegal immigrant and that's why this happened. It's, it's this desperate need for making quick sense. We want to jump to the quickest conclusion here instead of taking the time to actually get to know the person. Yeah, and we have to be willing to have those courageous conversations, Sandra, like you're doing with a lot of the work, and really peel the onion layer back, because if we sit at the surface level, because let's be honest, we have all had our stand with unconscious biases and the way we perceive things, but whenever we wake up and we really look at things holistically, then we realize how we need to work on ourselves inwardly in order to become better externally. So we can begin to link arms with other people who don't look like us. And it could be the product of our environment. It could be what was passed down to us for generations because whenever you're in a racial group that has been oppressed, they teach you to build a wall up and you may not always wanna let individuals in because because it's what you taught but but as you get older and you become wiser and you go through life you need to understand okay is this really true and if not what do I need to do to really seek out the truth so I could be better for myself but then also future generations to come to shift the narrative yes and I think you're speaking very uh, um, eloquently to the issue of separation right? That's where it all starts. You know, you start separating things, you start separating people. And that's when, you know, the, I, these ideas of, of just misunderstanding, miscommunication, instead of coming together and actually listening to each other and listening to each other from each other's perspective, not listening to each other with this race to judgment. So I, I you know what you, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think that's amazing. And I know you focus on the effects of racism because you have endured it personally as well as professionally. And I can say the same, especially coming from a male dominated field, which is ran by the good old boys or older white men, which is oil and gas. And I dealt with that for 12 years. And plus um, just dealing with my, with my family, just mixed, mixed races and just seeing my parents come over to America to make a better life for themselves and seeing the way that they were treated versus someone who is truly African-American or Black American is totally different. And it's different from Americans treating them. And it's also different from the way that foreigners also interact with the Americans because they have a viewpoint. So can you talk about the effects of racism that happened to you personally and professionally and how that has led you to start your organization? 
Sure. I mean, as a child growing up in North London, uh, we were the only quote unquote Indian family, even though we were Anglo Indian. It didn't matter because that's what we looked like and, and this very white population. And it was it was a little difficult. Um, kids would follow me home throwing stones. So I got to be really good at running. And that actually turned into a positive. I started racing for the, for the local district sports and won prizes. <laughs> so, so something good came of that. Um, but it was early training. <clears throat> and as a child, I found myself walking to the very inside of the sidewalk or the outside of the sidewalk. So the person coming towards me wouldn't have to go to the trouble of thinking up some kind of racial slur. I tried to be invisible. And so it was that idea that followed me into adulthood. And, you know, even as a, a working in academia, well, not even, you know, academia is notorious for racism. Um, the 20 plus years I spent in academia proved to me over and over again how women of color, particularly their voices are shut down. Even if you get a token person in authority or as a dean or as a manager or somebody, they will not be even a third of the population. So you'll have, for example, an all white academic Senate who has you know, the say so on what happens. So I, for me personally, watching my students so full of hope, so bright, so well qualified, getting the interviews, getting the jobs, and then getting smacked down by the same racism and watching them being broken in the workplace and then coming back and talking, why is this happening? Why am I not getting you know, promotional opportunities when I can see them happening? Why don't I get the opportunity for, for professional development? And that's what made me think this has got to, this has got to change. So you know, here I am, retired officially from academia, just like I chose to retire it was just, I'm done with this. I need to have a different life here and I need to make a difference. So it was because of watching those students over the years, in addition to my own experiences and watching colleagues go through the same thing and seeing how difficult it was to get DEI into colleges and seeing how difficult it is to shift that needle. It was just, we need something else. We need something else to help women release stress from their bodies, know how valid and important their stories are, how connected they are to their ancestors and connected to the young poets and activists and politicians and bloggers who are the vanguard, well, not the, they're the foreguard, they're the oriflams right now leading the way forward. And from there being introduced to the idea of mentorship. Yes, I just love everything. And as you're talking about it, you light, you light up because you saw there was a problem, but you're like, I'm not just going to let this be a problem. I'm going to be a solution to the problem. And I love that you took a stand because how many people have these amazing ideas, but they never stand up because they don't want to go against the status quo. They don't want to put their quote unquote neck on the line because then people are going to single them out but then if you don't do that then what's going to happen to your children your grandchildren your great-grandchildren and future generations to come because this movement is bigger than us and right. it is a movement and if we don't do something to stop the bad treatment that's being happening now then we're just being part of the problem in my opinion yeah I have to say um I left teaching before I left, you know, left college before I started this business. So it's not as kind of <laughs> as, uh, as, as brave as you, as you made me out to be. Um, but it's, um, for me, I'm a facilitator because those professional women are out there and they want to make a difference. They've, you know, they've clawed their way into their positions. They're holding onto their positions. They've managed to get some kind of promotion. Many of them are in management, upper management, very few in the C-suite. I'm still, you know, counting every year, you know, oh well, yeah, one more, that's cool, right? But it's, they're seeing that these things are not changing. And so that, you know, what are we doing then for the next generation? And even if you don't have kids, you want something different. You want, you know, you can see that bright hope coming in and you want it to burn, you want it to flourish. And so if you can take part in, in help lifting with a steel clad 
and fabric of support for these young women going into the workplace saying, I've got your back. You know something, I've trod this path. You can come to me, we can talk about this. I can tell you what to hold and when to drop. I can tell you when to go to HR. I can tell you how to build the story force field around you so that you can repel all those, those comments, those little remarks that people say, oh, I was just joking. That's not your story, that's their story. Let them suffer in their story. You've got better things to do. Yes, I love that fire, Sandra. And that brings me to the name, The Big Ass. Why did you call the organization Wild Women Leaders of Color? Because whenever I think about wild, it makes me think about the jungle, something fierce, something that's like getting ready to just kind of let go and just be free. So what was your reasoning behind the name? I love that definition. I love that fears getting ready to be free and jumping. But it was also about being freed of rules, being freed of patriarchalism, being freed of sexism and racism and standing up for what we know is going to heal. Because I believe with mentorship, uh, there are studies to support this. Women in tech jobs, women in, in um, academia have, have talked about how the lack of mentorship has been a, a major force in them not advancing in their careers. And I believe with mentorship, we can take down racism because racism will become irrelevant. Yes, and I could completely co-sign with that because when I would go to some of the oil and gas um, conferences, some of the C-suite women who don't necessarily look like you and I, up until, you know, after the whole movement with Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate, then you started to see more people get bumped up into these positions because I think it was good for the optics. Yes. Then we see that they start speaking out. So one uh, woman mentioned, every time you read a woman's magazine, they're always talking about looks and beauty and body. But she's like, I stopped reading that crap and I read men magazines because it talks about how can you get ahead in your business what you need to do to level up it gives you different tips and the punchlines are different so she's like if we want to start operating in those spaces we need to get in the mindset and shift our paradigm to right. see what makes it what right. makes it competitive for men and she's like i wish more women magazines would do the empowerment like the male magazines so she's like whenever i shift my thinking and my viewpoint not that i was diminishing my femininity but i was tapping us a, a bit into my masculinity and you can have both with a balance in order to get ahead and i love that she said that because how many times do we women just remain laid back because we think that things are going to come to us. But if we don't have that bulldog tenacity and fight for what we want and be so strongly grounded in who we are and have confidence, then we're going to get passed over time and time again. And there is a way that you can hold your own without compromising your morals and your values. Love all of that. So yes, yes, yes. Plus one to all of that. It's the um, a couple of things that came up. I believe we can do a combination. I don't believe it has to be all one way. Also, uh, traditional patriarchalistic attitudes are very much about being me first and there's I'm number one. It's a plateau. It's not a peak. There is plenty of room for everyone. And women do this. They're very inclusive. Yes, welcome. Join me on the plateau. We can make a lot of space for all of you. So that there's a sense of inclusivity. There's a there's a dominant attitude that says that you can, there's only one, there's only room for one person. And that's nonsense. We we can make it possible for more people to be included. And also. I think that women have such an incredibly creative approach and inclusive approach and compassionate approach to how business is operated. I believe it can work just as efficiently as you know, being competitive. I, I do believe that the idea of competition, at some level it can be good, but sometimes it's overdone so that you find people turn into the, you know, into, into snarling animals trying to hold on to a job or trying to keep somebody else out or guarding their secrets. And that sort of acts against the, um, the intentions of, the, of, of business, which is to make money. 
you include more people and you recognize those incredible women who are doing incredible jobs, yes, you are going to benefit. Yes, and some people say, is collaboration the new competition? And I say, no, mm -hmm. I think collaboration is the new way of synergies and how we are going to move ahead together and a lot faster and further versus if we did it alone. And there's more than enough room at the table for all of us. And I can say it from both ends of the spectrum, being a woman coming out of a male dominated field, sometimes the hardest ones to get along were the women because they were very catty because there wasn't a bunch of us in the mm -hmm. space. So they didn't want to necessarily give all their information because they're worried about, oh, is she going to take my job or whatnot? And then if they did see you move ahead faster than them, then they were wondering too. What did she do to get there? Did she sleep with somebody? Did she do something unscrupulous? And then you hear the chatter talking. And that's so much, that's, that's so true. And that's so much the fault of the style of management. And management needs to change because they're inculcating competitive attitudes and fear right? If you see that there are companies that take care of their employees, that encourage conversation, encourage transparency, encourage diversity, and you look at the companies where people stay, that's where you have good management. You look at the revolving door and you know that that's, it's toxic, right? And that's the women, that speaks to the women I work with who work in toxic environments, and knowing that they can't change the environment, but they can change their personal perspective that enables them to manage their bodies through stress and be able to manage themselves through the day. And now that you see that women who work in those toxic environments and they begin to do the work to change who they are and then do it inwardly and let it manifest outwardly, how do you think that's playing into what we see now, which is the great resignation? They, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because a lot of women just don't have that choice to vote with their feet. Right. And yes, there are there is, a, as you say, there's a lot of people just saying, I'm not going to do this anymore. But many women are not in that position. And those are the women that I tend to work with, which are just, OK, so how do we make this so you can manage and, you know, wait until your opportunity comes up so you can resign and go and take another job. But um, yes, you're right. You know, I think women women are done with being judged, with being, you know, told that they're inadequate, of being relegated to roles that never have, you know, opportunities for advancement, treated as though they, they shouldn't be invited, well, not treated as though they aren't invited to conferences and presentations, they're not given opportunities to helm their own projects. And so, yeah, women are getting sick of it, and damn straight, they should be sick of it. Um, but the exposure for that is, is really kind of, you know, it's, it inspires awe and a little bit of trepidation here because what's next? Yeah, and I think we need to keep the momentum going on what's next because whenever you start to think ahead, then it allows you to stay ahead of the curve because then you begin to come up with creative ways to stand out, creative ideas, and really embrace that innovation. So that way you have some form of control versus letting a situation control you. You're taking the power back and then you begin to navigate your own boat, yeah. which which brings me to the call to action part of the segment, Sandra. What is it that you want the audience to gravi gravitate to once they hear this segment, whether it's a challenge, whether it's an exercise or et cetera? Okay, there's a couple of things that we can do here. If you are working in a toxic environment and you find you don't have the opportunity or the option to leave, it's to practice breathing. And that, and that sounds very basic, right? But you do need to practice your breathing and you can, when, when you feel attacked or you, your body reacts and trust your body, your body knows what's going on. Don't feel, oh, I'm overreacting. We gaslight ourselves all the time, right? Oh, I'm being too sensitive. Oh, it was just a joke. Oh, they didn't mean it. No, your body knows and it's going into that fight, flight or freeze mode, right? So when you notice that happening, start breathing in and out slowly, just in and out for four, in for four and out for four. 
and in and out and in and out. And then you breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Once more, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. And that's called box breathing. And it calms the parasympathetic nervous system so that your body knows that you're back in control. Every, you're telling your body, it's okay, I've got you, everything's okay. And then you have, so we do the breathing first, and then you have a choice. Never let yourself be in the position where things are done to you. Oh, somebody is attacking me. Somebody told me I was inadequate. Somebody criticized the work. And then you go into victimhood. No, do not go into victimhood. You can react because yes, that, you know, something is coming at you and you, you know, your body feels like something's happening, but then you have a choice. How will I respond? And you can be creative about it. You can say, I'm going to wait until I'm calmer. I'm not going to speak. You might have an answer ready, but you need to know that you're in control of how you respond. Nobody can make you a victim unless you agree to it. Those are amazing tips. And thank you for sharing that, Sarah. And I mean, Sandra, and as you were doing the box breathing, Sandra, I was doing it along with you. And I hope I remember that as I'm in labor and delivery, because <laughs> I am going to need it so my body could get in control. You might need a few more drugs, but <laughs> well, for the workplace, the breathing should work. So Sandra, how can our audience connect with you via your website? And are you on any social media platforms? I am. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Facebook. If you look for Wild Women Leaders of Color and then you ask to join the group, I'll opt you in. We have an incredible workshop coming up on the 9th of June, which is tapping into your ancestral power to connect with your story. So we will be even if you don't know who your ancestors are, because many of us don't, and if we look back, it's faceless and voiceless, they are still there. And even if you don't know them, they know you. So this will be a workshop in knowing how to, to start to access your ancestors, whether it's through history or through bringing your ancestors into your space and knowing why that's so important for you in your story. And the more foundation you have, you know, this is your house. You get to choose the foundation. You get to choose what you put in your house. This is your house. You choose that foundation. Once you have your story as your foundation, you can do anything. Your life will never be the same. And then Sandra, say um, your website for the listeners and viewers. I, my website is being built. As okay. Me. So you can find me through LinkedIn or through Facebook right now. Okay. Via Wild Women Leading. Wild Women Leaders of Color. Leaders of Color. Okay, yeah. perfect. I will have that in the show notes. And I want to thank you so much, Sandra, for coming on the platform and just sharing your knowledge, insight, and wisdom. Audience, all of Sandra's contact information will be in the show notes. Don't forget to like comment and subscribe. We're on 40 plus platforms. You could also see the video of this on YouTube by going to our channel, which is at Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp. And lastly, but not least, I want to thank each one of you for tuning in on a regular basis to support the guests that I bring on to the podcast, as well as the mission to spread content that is educational, inspirational, and motivational while we weave in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Because believe it or not, it does take all of us coming together to make this world a better place. So until next time, peace love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day.